Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to the channel to Drawing with Michael. I am Michael, of course. This is um, toned paper today. I've got my little stubby carmine red call erase pencil that I'll be utilizing. I'm going to be doing a bird today, sort of a bird pirate. I've <clears throat> been doing a lot of 3D sculpting lately, and it's just been a little bit taxing on my brain. I have to think different whenever I 3D sculpt. I don't know if you guys that 3D sculpt on a regular basis have that issue, but I know I do. I basically have to think completely different in terms of how I visualize things and, and you know, basically go about doing characters and whatnot. Um, Every single time I do a 3D sculpt, I learn something a little bit different, and that's always a good thing. Um, I use ZBrush, for those of you who wonder what software I use. I tried using Blender for a while, I didn't really get into the hang of that, and then I tried to use um, Maya, which I got maybe two legs into Maya, and I'm like, you know what, I'm not really interested in this. And before that, I would used uh, a piece of software, Cinema 4D, and I actually did some animation in that program. It was a high learning curve, but overall, it wasn't too bad. <clears throat> so today we're going to be drawing a pirate bird. For those of you who are interested, um, hopefully you are since you're on my channel, and it is coming to the end of the semester. You guys know, if, if you frequent my channel at all, you know that I'm a teacher. I'm a college professor at the local college teaching illustration and photography. And I love to teach. It's one of my favorite things to do. Just because I wanted to give all the, the kidlins the things that I didn't have when I was in college. Now, don't get me wrong, I had great teachers. Um, but whenever I got out, I realized that I didn't have a lot of the things that I needed um, whenever I was in school. And, you know, I wanted to at least, at the very least, give an opportunity for those uh, students who want it. Not everybody, not every student wants to be told about things in the marketplace. Some of them have to experience things on their own because basically they think you're an idiot. You know, all teachers are idiots, right? Um, but that being said, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy giving back. And we're coming to the end of the semester, which means finals, which means end of the year projects, which means stress, which means do or die, choose. Right, and I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing some of the uh, standout students that have been consistent in paying attention and listening and, and, and doing things outside of class and, and sketching and doing all the things that I remember doing when I was in school. Um, and those are the ones who are really excelling and doing a good job. And some of the students that, you know, don't take... Uh, you know, don't take things seriously and just kind of, you know, float along and, you know, I'm, college is an experience. It's, you know, it's an expensive experience, I'll tell you that. You know, and they're going to do whatever they want to do. And you know what? In the beginning, I was, I was upset about things, right? About certain students, you know, doing certain things. And I'm like, you guys, you can't waste this opportunity, you know? Because I'm here on the other side. It's like, <laughs> How do I equate it? It's like I've crossed the river. I'm on the other side of the river. I can see what's on the side of the, on the other side of the river, and I'm saying, you guys, you know, it's very cold over here. You need to wear a jacket. Make sure you wear a jacket. And everybody on the other side of the river that hears my voice, they're like, hmm, I can hear what you're saying, but you know what? I need to go over there. I need to find out for myself. And you know what? I was upset at first about. Um, you know, some of the moments and, and instances where the students would kind of ignore what I say. But, you know what? 
it is one of those deals where we're human beings and it's exactly what my wife said. You can tell them, but it won't really matter because they have to experience things for themselves. And, and you know, I look at that and I go, yeah, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to tell them, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say, help them, I want to help. But she's exactly right. They are going to do whatever they're going to do and it doesn't matter what I say. Right? It's like I can, I can bring you to the table to eat a grand feast of knowledge and experience and help and then you don't have to eat. That is completely up to you. So I just feel good about being able to go ahead and at least help some people. Right? And that's one of the things that I kind of had to get over. Man, you got to get over yourself. You can't help everybody. You can't do the work for them, which is completely true. I can't, you know? So I, I help and I, I try. And at the end of the day, they don't have to do anything I say. You know, to pass my class, you have to have effort. You have to adhere to the policies, right? You have to do the work. And you don't have to, you know, if you don't want to listen to Mr. Mike about practice and doing all other stuff, that's fine. I'm going to do what I can to help those that want to be helped. So that's pretty much where I'm at. <laughs> I can definitely see how certain teachers get, you know, kind of curmudgeon -y. You know, before I was looking at, at teachers and I was like, you know, you have to find a path. You have to find a way. And, and, and the reality is, is you can present a way and that might be your way. But the reality is, is I don't think that sometimes we realize that your way is not the only way. You know, as a teacher, even though if you have tons of experience, your way is not the only way. So that's kind of where I'm at. Anyway, it's been fun. It's been a great experience. You know, I, I've been a teacher for a while um, in K-12. through and, and at that level, you know, you're going to have the people that have attitudes. You're going to have the students that you know are still growing but they still have a semblance of respect but in college if they don't like you they don't have to like you if you have a personality conflict with somebody then that's what it is you're gonna have a conflict the thing is is you being the teacher you have the authority to do certain things to make that student uncomfortable but the reality is is even if you did things like that they still wouldn't respond so I do my best to present the table, and if they don't want to eat it at it, that's fine, just as long as they don't disrupt the class and do things to, you know, cause issues. If they want to fail the class, they can fail the class, you know. Anyway, that sounds kind of cynical, but I can, I, I've tried the other way, and I'll present, like I said, I'll present the uh, the best way that I know how, but ultimately they don't have to listen, right? That's kind of one of those deals, especially at the collegiate level. They'll do whatever they want, <laughs> you know? It is pleasant, though, whenever you see some students that really have just, you know, improved and inspired themselves to do greater things, and that's a really good thing. And I'm very happy. Sometimes it's just, you know, that little bump. You just need that bump. You know, maybe they hate you for it. But at least you got the words in them, right? So, today's drawing. What is it? A pirate bird. I don't know. I'm just... I'm just having some fun. That's all, really, when you think about it. <sighs> Um, what else? What else has been going on? Oh, it's cold. It's cold here in the mountains of North Georgia. So, in terms of anatomy of a bird, right? Birds have certain ana anatomical cues. Every bird's going to be a little bit different. Owls are a little bit different. Parrots are a little bit different. One of the things that I think really fools people an artist in general is the you know the anatomy of the bird a lot of it is feathers right even underneath 
you know, all this fluff, right? You have an, an anatomy. And you, you always have to remember that anatomy, obviously, if you're doing stuff like this, because you want to have some type of reference to the real world. So I've done enough birds in my lifetime. And, you know, especially when you do like anthropomorphic animals and try and give them hands and, and stuff like that, it doesn't always work out. And it looks kind of odd. I'm not saying that that's going to happen today. It might happen. Like I said, I'm doing my best here to kind of wing it. Right? Remembering where that balance is, where the front, it's like his chest comes out, it comes in. And that's going to be underneath. Here's the other part. And he's, he's got kind of a different stance. So I'm going to have this come down. I'm going to have this other foot come around. Here's a part of his other foot. His other foot comes way out here to kind of balance his weight because I don't want him to be off kilter. I want that gesture to be correct. Right? So what I'm doing is I'm basically just sculpting in and drawing in, you know, the feet. Right? It's got that kind of triangle balance here. So now I've got these feathers that come down like this. It's kind of like a, you know, he's got his arms crossed, so I've got this one finger here, and the other one goes over here, so I'm going to have the fingers come like this. Right? I don't want to have it come too far next to that beak. It's going to happen anyway. Oh well. I've got it here, and then I'm going to have that other one come right here. Even if it's just these three feather fingers, and I've got this feather finger coming here. I'm going to get this one coming right here, this one right here. And then we've got these feathers that kind of come down. So this front feather, or I'm sorry, this front wing comes here. So I'm going to have this come like that. Okay. I've got that come around here. I've got these other feathers that... Come like this. Not bad, not bad. And then he's got this plume that's going to come here like this and it's going to come up since it's on the ground. And part of it's going to be hidden behind him. Like right that. And I want it to have, see I want to be able to see the bottom part of it too so I need to bring that four, that four feather, the front feather up and all that will be shaded underneath. Right, so I have that here. This is a little bit longer. This one's a little bit shorter. And the layering comes around here, here, here. Good. Oh, that's not bad. Not bad. Not bad for a red line sketch. Not spending too much effort on it. He's got his other eyeball kind of hidden. And he's got his neck feathers here, and I've got this other comes right here, and that feather, basically that, that these fingers are coming from, this wing comes here, and then you're going to have some of the feathers that kind of go this way, a little bit longer. This is the secondary feathers that are from this wing right here, okay, here, here. Oh, I'm going to be doing a review of a new computer soon. Woohoo! I ordered another computer. Why? Why do I need another freaking computer? Good Lord, Mike. How many do you have? Have mercy, dude. You got two, you got so many devices. Here's the deal. My device is a little bit older. And every single year, I have to buy something because I'm a freelancer. And I was going to buy a 3D printer, but we have a 3D printer at the school. And honestly, the 3D printer that I was looking at, it was messy and expensive. And I don't know how to use the 3D print technology just yet. And I don't want to spend, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred, or even thousand dollars on something that's going to have a huge learning curve. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the printer at school, get better acquainted with it. And then, that's just common sense. Then, 
I'm going, it's like buying a race car and thinking, I'm going to win the Indy 500, even though I don't know how to drive a race car, right? So, basically, <laughs> I'm going to learn how to use the print technology, determine what type of printer, if I'm going to use a filament printer or if I'm going to use a, um, a resin printer. And once I get a little more secure in printing, not so much creating the files, I know how to create the files for 3D printing, but now I'm going to actually be utilizing 3D printing technology, um, possibly to create some jewelry. I'm going to create some jewelry. I had a really cool idea. I was talking to one of my students, and she, uh, she really sparked an idea in me, which is great. So I'm possibly going to do some really fun jewelry and sell it. Um, anyway, so what I'm saying, I'm getting a new computer. It's a Dell. I'm getting a Dell, bruh. And that's really cool. Um, I've been looking at uh, different computers for a while. I currently own a Surface book. Um, you guys know that I, I like the Surface line. It's good. But the, the thing with the Surface line is it's so expensive. Oh, my gosh. Surface products are so expensive. Let me see where we're at. Okay. They're so expensive. And, you know, a, a, a Surface product, a Microsoft Surface product, um, you know, with, with the specs of my new computer of my Dell was going to be almost $2,800. And I'm like, I'm not paying that. So I ended up getting a really great deal on my Dell and Spirion. I believe it's a 7573, um, all in one 15.5. It's the eighth generation, um, Intel quad core processors. And it's got uh, 16 gigs of RAM, upgradable to 32 gigs, and just a, a fantastic machine um, overall SSD. Um, but uh, what's really cool um, about it is the machine. I thought this was really fascinating. It says it supported AMR, Wacom AMR technology, and um, Intrig. So I thought that was fascinating. So we'll see if that's the truth. If it's not, no big deal. I, I use Intrig all the time. Um, and it'll be a great machine. And it's got a dedicated GPU. So it's an i7 processor. Um, just a fantastic machine. And I'm, I am anxious to get it. Should be here next week. And I'll do a review for you guys um, to see if it is a great machine. Now, it will be comparable, I believe, to a Wacom Cintiq uh, Mobile Studio Pro. Um, hopefully it uses the Wacom technology. Not a big deal, like I said. Um, in terms of power, because I know that they just updated their machine. I saw a review on that. Um, I currently own an HP ZBook X2 G4 that has a really, it's a really powerful machine and it uses Wacom technology. Um, so I'm anxious to get the computer in and have fun with it. It's a big screen, so I'm, I'm anxious to really dive in and have fun doing some fun artworks for you guys. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you guys on time lapse for the inking process. And whenever we do the inking process, then I will possibly do the uh, the um, marker process for you guys. Uh, to enjoy. Let me bring this further down right there. There we go. Okay, he's fun. Okay, so enjoy the inking process.
Okay, so the inks are done. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back with my little eraser. My rubber eraser. I think it's rubber. Feels like rubber. Typically, I'll use a plastic eraser. Plastic erasers, um, I guess they're plastic. I don't know. I always question that. Felt like rubber. I don't know where my white one is. My white eraser is. I don't want to get rid of all of the red because I like to have the red in there. The alcohol of the markers goes in and it mixes a little bit with the red hue. Kind of brings out some warmth. So I'm going to keep that in there. Um, have a little fun. Have a little fun today. Been pretty stressed with work. But sometimes you just need to stop. You just need to stop, right? Stop, stop with the stress, right? So you guys know typically what I'll do is I'll put in my local color, which is what I'm going to do, right? I want this to be a red parrot. So unfortunately, oh, I don't think I have a good red. Oh, that's a good red. Okay, maybe this is and that's a bubble red. I do have one of these. <gasps> Look at that. Ah. Yep, that's the money shot right there, baby. So I'm gonna put in my local color with the red, and then this will probably be gray. Maybe I'll put some blue. Maybe I'll put some blue and green. That's what I'll do. So that's my next step. I might just put I might put in this first, and this will be the darker. Because this is really heavy handed. So I'm going to see what I'm going to do as I kind of figure out my process here. But I think he's turning out okay. I want to put something over here. I keep feeling, I like that little line right here because everything's pointing. His body posture is kind of pointing over here. I want to put something right there, but I don't know what yet. So I've got to think about that as I draw. Anyway, so put in a local color. Once I get that done, I'll go ahead and bring you guys back and tell you what I'm going to do next. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about marker techniques. So you guys know that I like blocking. I, I do my sketch, I put my ink color or my ink down, and then I start putting in the um, local color. And then now I'm putting in um, 
Again, I'm putting in local color, but what I'm doing, I wanted the orange to shine through a little bit more, and then I put down this nice uh, kind of a pinkish, uh, it's called coral, so it's got a, a nice coral look to it, and I wanted that to shine through, and then for my highlights, I wanted it to be a little bit warmer. So what I'm doing now is I'm coming back with this very saturated red, okay, and I'm going in and I'm giving just a slight semblance of texture and shadow and shade in some of these areas. So whenever this red goes down and it mixes in to the orange, it's going to be warmer in some areas where I leave it. But then for the shadows, it's going to be nice and cool. <clears throat> so that's, you know, that's just one of those deals that comes with working with the medium. Um, you know, the marker medium a little bit more and understanding how they mix. And also, it's very important that you guys understand color theory. You know, color theory is just one of those things that you learn. You learn either through school <laughs> or you learn through practical application. You know, schooling is great for structure, um, but as I've realized, especially recently, some of the students could care less about color theory because they got it, right? I got color, right? I, got, I know what color is. No, you don't. The color is so complex, right? And I'm not even there. I'm, I'm still learning about all the complexities of color. And that's one of the big things that I think I came, you know, away with from college whenever I was in college was the fact that I did not know a lot. I, I was very green, per se, right? You know, I got my first job doing apparel uh, with Foot Locker uh, Incorporated. Back then it was called Venator Group. Venator owned a myriad of different um, companies. And one of the companies that was owned by, by the Venator Group slash Foot Locker um, was a company in Bradenton called Team Edition Apparel. And eventually they rebranded and went with Foot Locker Incorporated. And I worked with them for a few years and I learned a lot. You know, I didn't learn everything that I needed, but I did learn a lot. And that was important. Coming away from that, I moved to Orlando and then things kind of evolved from there. But one of the things that I always remembered was a was a was uh, an assignment that I did. I forget the teacher's name. Um, back then she had some medical issues. I'm not sure if she's still with us. But she was uh, a great painting teacher. She's a little lady. Gosh, I forget her name. That stinks. I hate that. Anyway, um, and she made us learn color. We had to do these incredibly complex mixture boards with, you know, just a, a myriad of, of color saturations and learn what a tint was, what a hue was, what a shade was, you know, all those uber complex things that as students we really think we have a grasp and a hold of but really we don't and she was gracious enough to be patient and she you know she taught us and and I commend her for that you know like this so notice the difference between putting this red color on this pink color so it it, it desaturates it a little bit but then whenever I put it on the orange it becomes a warm red, right? Because of that underlying red tone. I'm sorry, not tone, red hue underneath. I'm thinking tone because I'm, I'm putting in, like, I'm causing the red to be a tone, basically. Um, but it's still a hue of that red, of that orange. So whenever I put it on the blue, it turns purple, right? So that's, you know, in terms of shading, that's what I want. So I'm putting just these ever little highlights here and there, right? Now I'm going to come back in a minute whenever I start putting in the, uh, the shading, because I haven't even started the shading yet. Um, and you guys are going to see it transform. It's going to be awesome. And I'll do, uh, you know, I'll do a little ditty for that here in just a second. Enjoy the time lapse.
Okay, so what I'm doing right now is I'm just basically putting in a little bit of value here and there um, to give a little bit more contrast to the piece. Right now the piece is a little flat. So I'm just, you know, putting in a couple areas here and there. I'm using this blue right here, um, the Prismacolor. <clears throat> it's a, called Blue Slate. It's more or less a, a neutral. It's kind of like a gray, but it's got a little bit more blue in it. So I want to give it some cool shadows here and there to really contrast with the warmth. And also, whenever I put it on the red, it turns like a nice purple. So that's what I'm doing right now. Now remember whenever you guys are doing markers, um, the initial swing of the marker is going to be darker, and as it dries, it's going to get lighter. That's pretty standard whenever it comes to, you know, paint in general. Um, but, um, you know, markers are interesting because they it's, it happens really fast. So I've got nice color variation and hue um, going really nice. So I'm going to hit it again in a couple areas here and there just to kind of make things pop a little bit more. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back with highlights and just start bringing stuff out. You know, putting some texture in and just really having a lot of fun. Um, putting some texture in the, uh, in the overall body. Right, I'll blend some of these colors a little bit better as I go through. And whenever I start to add the Prisma pencil, I'll, uh, <clears throat> you know, near the end, I'll, I'll pop in really quick and just give a, a real quick wrap up uh, for you guys. So, all right, on to the Prisma color. Okay, that's it. That's all for today. I'm not going to go too much further with this one. Um, just wanted to, like I said before, have some fun. Do a little bit here and there. One of these days I am going to bring these to full finish. One of these. <laughs> just so you guys can see what is possible with this particular combination of media. It is one of those deals, you know, whenever you look at a piece and you you think it's finished and but the, you know the reality is I could I could sit here and I could render this for at least another four hours messing around with it. But you know maybe you know maybe that's what I'll do. Maybe I'll bring one of these to complete uh, to complete finish and see what you guys think of it. I know that these take a little bit longer, but at the end of the day, it is a good uh, practice. So <coughs> like and subscribe if you like what you see, and we'll see you guys later. Bye.